Thank you so much. Thank you for joining. Um, my name is Javier. I don't have an about me slide, so I'm going to save you that time. Um, you can always search on LinkedIn. Um, thank you for being here today. Uh, and, and yes, we are going to try to talk about this today. Uh, but before that, I just want to ask all of you, raise your hand if you ever experienced a reorg, and keep it, raise it if you like it. <laughs> okay. Good, okay, this is, is, is the right audience, so let's talk about it. Um, so let's start with uh, a little bit about my team today. Um, so um, I joined Carta at the beginning of 2021, and since then my team has uh, had multiple configurations, and uh, those changes are still happening and are going to continue happening the next year. Uh, also since then, the core of my team has been the same, has not changed much. Uh, sometimes uh, engineers are encouraged to try new challenges in different organizations. Sometimes uh, they are encouraged to grow and fly outside of Carta. Uh, but I'm, incredible, I'm very privileged to have one of the most reliable and efficient teams and productive teams at the company. Um, this is by far to me one of the most, most supportive teams that I ever had, and one of the most inclusive ones, and also has become one of the most resilient ones in my career. Um, so it's an amazing team. Um, however, it has not been easy. Um, Carta is also the company where I have experienced the biggest number of reorganizations ever in my career. Uh, and also, uh, where I have spent the most amount of time reworking uh, or planning or roadmaps or, or strategies as a team. So it's, it's, that's not easy, that's not fun, that's not something that I enjoy. And if that was my own experience, uh, you can imagine how it, was being, how it has been for anyone that joined with me or after me, right? Or even several years before me. Um, so since I joined, um, I constantly hear the strolls uh, from our engineers, from our managers, uh, the stress that every reorg cost, uh, the, the, the frustration and pain <laughs> every time we have a meeting to rebuild our uh, a roadmap or rebuild our next year plan. Um, and the constant uh, uh, hits on morale when you face also with uh, some negative press and reductions in force, right? Um, and and if, if you have here recently about Carta, that's something that keeps happening, right? So how do I deal with it? How do I manage to still have that organization? How do I manage to still have that team that is in the pictures that still wants to work here, that still wants to keep building things? So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about that um, today. Um, how do, how do we came that resilient? Uh, are we there yet? Do we need to do anything more? Uh, well, it has not been easy, has not been fast, and still far away from perfect. Uh, I'll go today over a particular section of the actions that we took, and some data, some, 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 data, some examples that helped, at least helped me or approach to become a more resilient organization and an organization has been able to stay afloat despite all the things that you saw on the previous slide. Um, so, um, first, like, when you talk about resiliency, like, well, I can chat GPT that, and chat GPT and Google can give me a few options, and if you do it right now, or if you do it today, these are the things that you mostly are going to find, right? Uh, resiliency is not like a difficult topic or, or difficult to find topic. It's, it's actually uh, very universal because some of the problems that I describe in my second slide are actually universal. You're, every single one of you that raise your hands, you have this problem in the past, right? So, so when you are dealing with, with this problem and you search for these solutions and then you read seven books about it, you ended up with this huge list of things that you should do better, right? And then everybody told you, oh, this is the framework that you should do and, and use to do better and generate resilience. It's like, yeah, sure, uh, I don't know. Like, 
Maybe like invest in training, yeah, sure, but we are doing re like resources in force because we don't have enough budget to invest in many things. So, so these ended up being like not very useful, right? Um, articles and theory are easily agreeable. You don't disagree with that, but if you are here, it's because sometimes you have tried that and you don't really know how to achieve that. So let me give you some uh, more clear examples and, and present to you one of the major factors that has helped me in this, this problem. So today I'm going to share um, a vision on communication and how communication can help you to build a resilience organizations. Um, so today I'm going to show you a few examples on how for me it's really important to listen to the individuals, to talk to the humans, and to trust your team. So, the premise that I'm presenting to you today is like, while well, you can find a lot of literature about how to become resilient, in practical, in reality, if you do th these three things, then you may get there faster than you imagine. Um, so let's talk about the first one. Listen to the in individuals. Uh, I hope you're already doing this. This shouldn't be like a surprise to anyone. I hope that you already have these conversations with every member of your team. But I hope also that you are truly hearing what your team members have to say, right? Hearing a team member is not just about like, hey, talk to me, let's do a high five, and let's move on, right? Um, really be curious at listening every single member of your team is the, is the main foundation of mutual respect, right? It might sound like a... a like a, let's sing Kumbala and then let's, let's dance. No, 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 this is real. Like, what are the type of conversations that you have with your team and how do you actually do it and what is the amount of time that you dedicate for, it, for, for that? Um, it's more like always hearing what they have to say that whenever you face an issue, they, they really feel like you have their backs. It makes every person feel like they are value, that they're a value part of the team, and, and when morale is, 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 uh, is high then, uh, and problems are right, then things are a little bit easier to handle. Um, so how do you hear people, right? I'm not going to lie, like uh, it's tempting just not doing it. And the higher you get actually as, as you keep growing your career and then you became a senior director and a VP and then the C-level, the less time you are going to be able to have that. But the reality is like, for me, at least in my case, there has not been really a replacement for the one-on-one, -on -one, right? And it's always a problem. It's a calendar problem, right? And I try multiple things. I try like uh, the, the uh, uh, office hours, right? And I try different formats. I try like, like people joining instead of me setting the schedule. But the real, and I try multiple software away. again. We try confirms, we try Lattice, we try Workday. And the reality is like what I figured it out, that there is really no replacement for the one-on-one. -on -one. It's key. Um, but, but why? These are the most common questions that I have on my one-on-ones, right? Um, this, these are the main topics that I discuss in my one-on-ones. But the reality, how, how does it look, right? Um, somebody came to the one-on-one -on -one and asked me, last month we were working on change. And this month, we are working in growth. What changed it, right? Um, it has been very difficult for me to work with X team. They don't hear me, they don't like me, and we are fighting all the time. Uh, or more complex topics. My brother was diagnosed cancer last week, so um, I don't have head for anyone. I ca cannot concentrate at work. Uh, or another common one these days, I read on blind that we're having layoffs soon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, or something completely unrelated, like I really believe we shouldn't be using Kafka. Oh, cool, right? So these are the type of questions that I get on my one-on-ones, right? And, and I use a few examples, but these are the topics. And these are always the kind of topics that I hear, or at least the ones that I start hearing when I joined the company. Every single one-on-one -on -one was about that. Right? So I established that by hearing and understanding, you can actually find the patterns about what are the real issues that are affecting your organization and then decide to do something about it. 
Uh, the, the most common answer, so I presented data about what are the most common questions. The most common answer on those one-on-ones were like, actually, me answering with more questions. That was the most common answer that I gave them, right? Um, the classic, tell me more, right? And they give you a question, tell me more, tell me more, and get as, as much information as you can. Okay, seems like you have a misunderstanding, and for some reason, what I know, you don't know. So let me give you the context. Let me tell you what we as an engineering leaders, we believe, and what the executive team at the company is thinking by making this decision. You know, their answer is like, okay, um, let me answer you with a story. There was a time when I hate my manager, and this happened, and this is how it solved it, right? Or um, try help them to get to the answer themselves, right? Like, uh, what do you think is the best option for this? If you were here, what are the things that you will do? Um, or simply acknowledging that I don't have a question, an answer, right? I cannot tell you what is happening right now, but let me figure it out for you, right? And the majority of my answers, based on the data of the most common answers that I gave to them, was trying to even get more information. Again, going back to my first topic, listening. Listening is key. The more information you get, the more deep you get in those conversations, the more you are going to be able to diagnose what are the major issues that you actually need to solve. Uh, and what happened after that? What has happened after a year, right? Um, well, um, after, after we get to that point, um, now we're in a position that I can reach the level of information that I need by hitting and identify the problems that we need, right? So by doing that, I have been able to understand and acknowledge when we do something wrong, when we do something we shouldn't be doing, uh, and, and, and make me accountable of it, right? And reach to them and say, hey, we make a mistake, we are learning, this is what we are going to do. Whenever I hear like, hey, you have personal issues, we can work on them and we can let you work on them. We have up and downs, that's, that's human nature. We know how to rest, we try to understand each other and we, we create that personal connection by just listening. And that's just the first part, listening, right? The picture is Julio and that's Celine. Uh, they got married last year, they live in Rio. The, uh, Julio is an engineer manager on my team and has been the company for four years now. And I know that part of his career uh, uh, is, is keep growing and then get to a higher manual role and eventually became a solid, and solidify as a leader in Rio. Those are the things that, that Julia wants, right? And I was able to be able to know her, his wife and, and, and know everything about his life by really listening to them. I'm not saying you need to do that, but that's something that I got from all that listening experience. Um, but it's not perfect, right? While some of the initial topics and data that I show you that were the common topics that were in my one-on-ones, there's still some things that our team wants, right? I'm often reminded in my one-on-ones that these are the things that my team is looking forward the most. Keep that respect, keep honestly. They always keep me honest on my one-on-one. Javier, I, I hear you yesterday talking on all hands, and I don't know if this, I believe this, right? Can you tell me more, right? They always look for that empathy, right? Like, I, I know that you are upset that we didn't deliver this, but you also need to understand that this happened, right? And they are always asking for feedback, right? So. Um, I, I, sometimes I forget, the team is doing great, and I forget to tell them that it's great. So they came to the one-on-one, -on -one, they keep asking me, like, do you have any feedback for me, right? So by listening, I have been able to understand my team better, but also, um, um, it's still not perfect. They keep reminding me in those one-on-ones why it's so important. So that's the first topic, right? Listening more. The second, talk to humans. You have a group and you ha we have a team of humans, not robots, right? Treat your members of your team as, as what they are, intelligent and capable humans, right? Um, I was going to insert here in the meme about like you cannot handle the truth because that's often the reality for us. 
We, we don't believe that our team can actually handle the truth. We don't believe that they are going to keep that truth by themselves and it's not going to end up in the blind side, right? So, but, but the reality is like, if you talk to them as a humans and you share with them what really is happening, then you enable that environment, right? So treat them as humans and treat them as somebody who, sh who has the capacity to handle the truth. Um, so what is perceived as a transparent, right? So I, I, um, I work with my team and I told them like, we, we went through this year of data and, and surveys and it's like, um, what is really perceived as a transparent? And they came with this topic. This is what they believe that is perceived as transparent. And this is something that we didn't did since the beginning, but this is where we are today, right? Um, we have monthly happy hours, but more important, we have monthly all hands with my entire org when I go in front of them and tell them everything that is happening, right? If we have changes at the company, I communicate to them why we are having the changes. What is the reasoning behind that? Uh, if, if I know something that I know that they don't know, I share with them, right? And I tell them, who knows this? What is the extent of this knowledge? Why is happening again? And then try to share with them as much as I can, and also the things that I don't know, right? I try to share with them, be very open. This thing that you're asking me, I don't know. But as soon as I know, I will let you know, right? And that's the other important thing, regular updates. They are always asking me, do you know what happened with that? Yeah, sure, let me give you an update. Uh, and, and that was at the beginning, now it's like, they don't ask me anymore. I try to give them the base as soon as possible, right? Um, use plain language, right? It's very easy to try to go to chip chat GPT and then formulate a message to send a Slack to 100 person uh, group, right? Because English is not my first language, so it's easier to do it in chat GPT. But the reality is like people appreciate when you use the plain language, right? When it's actually coming out of you, that's when they appreciate it the most, and that's what is really feel transparent for them. And then follow through. If you say that you are going to look at it, then you do it, and then you come back to it, right? Um, and that generates those genuine interactions. Um, so a few examples how we do that. Um, this is a term that I use very often, the company agnostic point. Um, a few, couple of months ago, I went to the Rio office, and I have a couple of chats with the whole engineering team, even people outside my team. And then we discuss about career development, career expectations, and we also discuss about the difference between expectations in the US and Brazil, right? We were very open, and I show data to them, say like, regular and engineer in the US joins a company, and the highest expectation they have is to stay four years at the company at most, and then move to the next one. But if you don't know, that's not the same expectation in Brazil. When I ask the engineers in Brazil, say, I'm joined here and I expect to be 10 years at the company, right? So I went to them and say, like, let me show you the expectation that we have in average with our engineers in, in, in the US, our engineers in Canada, and your engineers in Rio. I'm not saying that your expectation is wrong. I'm presenting you the information. So you use that information from an company like company agnostic point of view. If you are formulating your career today, this is what you should expect that your peers are also expecting, and this is what you are expecting, and then use that information and use it in your career development, independent of what the company can offer you, right? Um, um, having individual expectations when I have my skip levels, when I have my direct uh, 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 like one-on-ones, the same. Let's create your career path, company agnostic. What do you need? What do you want? Where do you want to be? Let's create a plan for you to grow you independently of the opportunities that the company is going to give you. If we can give you opportunities, if you are there, then we will use them. And if I know more about what you want and I can actually route what we are working on into doing that, then we will do that. But let's not expect that the company is always going to accommodate to you and you are going to be accommodated to the company, right? That's easy to say. That's something that we all know. How many of you really have that talk with your directs? Like openly, right? In a company setting, in a recorded meeting. That's the difficult part. 
That's the difficult part, and that's something that has helping us a lot to create that, that uh, uh, trust within the team and actually in the long term to be a resilient one. Um, and the hi, everyone. This is, this is a joke because uh, this is actually the start of the majority of the message that I send on Slack. Um, so I try, I actually measure myself to send at least three or four messages a week to the entire white org. Sometimes it's my direct report, sometimes it's my extended team. But there is no week that I don't send at least two messages to them and explain them what is happening, what happened during the week, what I work on, what are the challenges that I have in, how we are solving them, and what are the things that I don't know. Right. This is actually something that I do, and then when I don't, the team actually came to me, it's like, Javier, you didn't post anything this week. Right. So, um, is that the only way? No, but this, this something definitely has helping. Uh, so use it if, if it works for you. And the finally, the third concept and the most important, trust the group, right? If you want to be fast, if you want to be efficient, if you want to have like a, a very resilient person that do everything for you, go solo. But if you want to, even beyond that, right, um, do it as a group, the only real way is to trust them, right? Um, we move together, not alone. Uh, we we um, over-index on group efficiency, not individual efficiency. We over-index in group ownership versus individual ownership, and we don't expect predictable strategy. We expect predictable environment. How that works, what that means. Give me a few examples. Okay, so when we are creating uh, our, our different dashboard to measure the efficiency of the team, we don't measure the efficiency of the individual. We only measure the efficiency of the whole team. And we are discussing about who owns what. This is a very common discussion, especially in organizations that reorg a lot, right? It's always like, who owns these codes anymore? Oh, well, let me blame, JIT blame, and quickly find you the last engineer to work on it. We don't do that. We own it as a team. We don't own it as a specific six people engineer team. We own it as a whole corporations team, right? Who owns onboarding? Corporations. Who owns launch? Corporation. Who owns cap table? Corporation, right? What a specific team? It doesn't matter. Just drop it a corporation, somebody will take it. Because we own the team together, not individually. And we don't expect predictable strategy anymore. One of the things that I was able to realize when I realized that Carta was a place that was changing all the time and that needed that constant evolution, it was, I'm not going to be able to change that. That's a philosophy that the company has been working for the last nine years. Who I am to pretend that I'm going to be able to change that? What I need to change is the mindset of my team. So whenever that happens, that is inevitable, they are ready for it. Right? Why is important the first image that I show you at the beginning? Because that core team that I have at the beginning is still the same team. They have had multiple names, but they have worked together for over two and a half years, and they know what they are doing. Right? So the conversations have changed. The team don't longer ask me, like, Javier, I'm worried about the reorg, I'm worried about the layoffs. Like, what's next? Right? We are ready for whatever is next. Right? And that's where we want to go. Now, it's a constant problem because as a as, uh, flexible uh, company we are, I show you today that it was 53 engineers. By the end of the year, probably are going to be 75. So we need to bring the extra 20 engineers into the same mentality. Um, so I'm not solving for the entire company. I'm solving first for an organization and every member that joins that organization. And finally, a framework that I regularly use within my teams, the tripod, right? When we talk about like cross-functional product team, like group ownership, it's really key to define like what each, who represent that organization, right? So the majority of my teams are product teams. So there is a tripod for it. We have a product manager, an engineer manager, and a designer. And I, I, I regularly use a framework that I give them, like, these are your responsibilities. Start with that, right, and then distribute it across the team, right? This is something that, that we regularly use in order to uh, work, work, work together as a team. 
Um, so yeah, that's it. Those are the three things. What we have been able to achieve with that is to actually get a really solid core group that no matter how many reorgs, no matter how many changes in our plan are, are always ready to keep going. Right. Uh, these are pictures from our Carta different Slack channels. We have Carta Live channels in my organization uh, where people share things beyond their work. Um, some of them are very private, so I'm not sharing them. I'm sharing more like uh, in the, com in the off office setup, but uh, very popular channels they use. They all know each other. They all know what they like. They all know what they, we, we don't pretend to be a family, but everybody feels comfortable like voluntarily sharing their life. So that's, that's really cool. Um, so to recap, what we did at Carta differently. We focus in this framework of three different steps. Listen to the individuals, talk to the humans, trust the group. And that's what has been working for us. It's not perfect. We as a company keep changing. We as a company are going to continue to change all the time. Reorts are not going to die. Reductions in force are not going to die. But at least my org is OK with it and know how to deal with it. Um, so yeah, um, this is the framework that I recommend. Thank you all for listening. And yeah, if you have any questions, please let me know. Awesome job, Javier. It was so cool to see some of the things that actually like the outcomes of the culture that you built and the way, you know, your team brings up issues with you and, you know, that you are constantly following up and thinking about like, okay, I need to actually follow up on this thing that I said that I would do. And it's really great to see leaders like that for sure. So, um, yeah, thank you for, for this awesome presentation. I already, I have some questions of my own, but we, uh, we have pro time for just probably one or two questions from the audience. Uh, so let's see, let's jump to the first one. Can you share a moment when a seemingly disruptive reorganization actually led to a breakthrough innovation or unexpected positive outcome? Um, yeah, most of the time, most of the time. The latest that I can think about is like um, one of our latest reorganization. We decided to take a team out of the main organization, the fundraise team, and by that, we give them direct access to the executive team. We remove all the boundaries from different levels. It's like, you, you, this team is going to talk directly to the executive team every single week, mm -hmm. right? And in the last six months, fundraise has been one of the most successful areas of the company mm -hmm. because the speed that they have been able to acquire by doing that. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning, it was a little bit confusing. Are you taking us out of the org? Mm -hmm. Right? No, I'm just removing some of the layers so you can have access ah, to it. Right? Nice. So at the beginning, it was perceived like, Oh, you are separating us, <laughs> right? When it turns out it's something positive. Got you. Yeah, that's a really cool one. Uh, all right, I think we could probably do one more. Let's see. What would you not share with your team and why? This is a pretty interesting one. Ah, yes, interesting but easy. <laughs> Every company has a legal department, right? <laughs> and one of the foundational piece you as an executive is to actually have a relationship with your legal department. And the legal department is always going to be able to share with you what you cannot share with your team, <laughs> no matter how much you want. So uh, trust them, trust them. <laughs> they, they, they know what they are doing. So the fourth one is talk to the legal team. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Got it. All right, cool. Well, let's, uh, let's go to our question that we've been um, asking all speakers. What's one book that you would recommend to the audience that has changed the way you work or live your life? That's tricky because I don't recommend technical books or engineering books in general. Mm -hmm. uh, so books that change my life are more in the uh, sci-fi side. Mm -hmm. But I have one book that nobody has recommended today and nobody probably will. The book is called Engineering Executive and it's the next book that Will Larson is launching. Ah. <laughs> so, for everyone who don't know, Will Larson is my boss. So, uh, oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> he already has two very successful books. Uh, He's launching a new one. Was able to take a sneak peek, so I recommend that one. Got it. Yeah, and I love, I love Will's stuff, um, especially the staff engineer book as well. So, yep. yeah, great, great recommendation, I'm sure. Awesome. Well, let's give it up for Javier one more time. Thank you.